Hello, adventurers. I want to take a moment to tell you that all our content can now be found uninterrupted and commercial-free on Apollo Plus. Apollo Plus is a subscription-based service that enhances your audio fiction experience with ad-free access to your favorite shows and exclusive content, while at the same time supporting us all as creators to keep bringing you quality content. Please take a moment to check out Apollo Plus at apollopods.com or download the app in your Google or Apple app stores. Again, that's Apollo Plus, your new home for quality audio fiction. Hello, adventurers. So glad you made it back, and not a moment too soon. It seems we aren't alone in this forest anymore. Our scouts and patrons Rory Christensen, Lanny Flanagan, Jolene Fresquez, Haley Munoz, Daniel Nichols, and Brian Dowling. They've been tracking a small but powerful group moving swiftly towards our friends at the Nether Spring. We can't thank them enough for taking the risk to bring us this information. Now, there. Look, look just beyond there. Yes, over, over by those trees. Oh, no. Dawn of Dragons, Season 5, Episode 4, Uninvited Guests. The forest is cold here, isn't it, my brother? Yes, cold. And cruel. <laughs> well, you could have worn a shirt. <laughs> yeah, right. Despite the chill in the northern air, his jet black skin shone like polished obsidian, rippling over a powerful chest. He was decorated with gray tribal markings that formed several snakes tied together. His arms carried no weapon, and his legs wore a fur and leather war skirt that hung to the knee just above his tall black and red leather boots. Boots that squeaked slightly, being still new, she thought. She looked at her arms, powerful and strong. She smiled as she tensed a bicep and saw the shape form under her deep olive green skin. She also carried no weapon. You there, press forward. That had better mean, yes, ma'am. <laughs> well, not likely, but it looks like she's doing it. The barbarian woman was as high as three carts stacked on top of themselves, and her braided locks of frost-kissed gold hung in long strands, like the cables of a ship. She came from the Northlands, the old country, one of those broken giant lands rarely traveled by anyone and only open to trade at certain times of the year. The giant was an outsider, more so than they were in their large group. Eben spotted a faint wisp of smoke from the next rise in the hills where the emerald trees parted. Perfect. We should make camp soon. We still have another day's journey. Mardog, set up camp in the glade there, and then join me for a hunt. I sense... <laughs> I sense someone as a fireplace burning, welcoming us. <laughs> yes, I can see that. Right away. For our people, my sister. For our people, Evan. She looked around at the troops walking beside them. Various green and gray tones behind black and red armor graced these warriors from the jungles of the Deadlands and the plains of Troll. Powerful orc warriors. She smiled, revealing more of an upward tusk tucked behind her lip. These were her people. Hours later, 
The dying screams of the Glen Valley shepherds they had found were silenced in the foothills and replaced by the smell of their flocks stewing and roasting and the three fires scattered throughout the orc camp. The meat was delicious, she thought, as she sat alone in her officer's tent. The smell of the pine trees and food was a pleasant one. The burning sap seemed to flavor the meat and give it a spiciness that the mutton needed. The rendered fat peeled back as she bit into the leg she awarded herself. Juicy. Salty. And as she came to expect, perfect. The shepherd's fear sweetened it a bit, she thought fondly. She imagined it raw. Not as appetizing, to be sure, but more familiar. More feral. She nodded at the feeling, and setting the leg down in the small folding table, she licked her fingers clean, wiping the last bits of moisture from her hands on the cloth tunic tucked underneath her dark armor. She opened the small leather-bound journal and read the random entry upon which her fingers fell. Third day of Ebermoon, 1509. Yes, now my people suffer so. Never in my memory has our jungle been so cruel. The tall, mossy bungaroot trees rot in their stumps, and the leaves now mold before the sweet fruit can arrive. The birds have left their nests bare of any eggs and haven't been seen in months. Our tribe is small, but still the bounty usually found in its swamps is rotten and can rarely afford to feed us all. Our elders and young grow sick. Eben and Sable. <sighs> A wave of icy cold emotion rolled across the fire from her proud heart at the mention of his name. A long forgotten wound ached now, but she continued to fall onto the path. A path of recalling memories in her old journal and recalling another life. She sighed and thumbed a few pages into the future of the journal. The blight wasn't something she wanted to recall anyway. First day of Spring Blossoms, 1510. Our champion has returned. Muldros, powerful Muldros has returned. I was barely a young child when he disappeared over two decades ago. His eyes burn with a fury similar to Eben or Sable's anger, but it never fades. He's constantly enraged and cold at the same time, intimidating and ferocious. Beautiful. He is all the elders had told us he was. Perfect. His great club holds tales of his battles and victories in its twisted knots, and Evan has told me the most glorious thing. He is actually my brother by blood. I can feel the fire of his might flow in my own veins. We went to the center of the village, where the rise in the ground allowed the water to drain away, and downward, the sulfuric smell of the brine and swamp water lessened here, and one could take the large gulps of air to address everyone. When he speaks, my heart soars, knowing he can lead us out of this famine and into better things. He plans to lead us to conquer the Darkroot tribe and take back our land from them. Sable seems distant now, though. Quiet. Satan, why don't you watch us? Let us walk in the victory! You promised we wouldn't battle again. We would be different. Promise is just a mere words, and that was then. It means nothing here. Come, can't you see? Maldros is back. Maldros! And he brought the stone. You and I don't have to hide anymore. We can be our greater selves. Maldros, we are here to serve you, my brother. Maldros turned to the three of us, standing together behind him as projected to our gathering village. Wrapped in black gauze like a mummy made of the moonlit clouds at night that seemed to cover all exposed skin and even his own helmet. As do I. Asquib, my dear baby sister, you no doubt hold a great fire in your belly for battle, do you? Yes, and revenge upon those that let our people 
Let our people starve. Have you seen the glory that is our brothers, true selves? Or do they still hide them behind some ancient agreement? Our agreement was between us, not you. Your agreement let me be captured two decades ago and let me rot in a cage, little brother. Let this be your last chance at redemption. You know as well as I do, Maldros. My reputation doesn't depend on you. <laughs> you fool. You could cast aside the promises that make you weak. I stand before you to offer freedom. No. No, my lost and misguided brother. I will not be ruled by my anger again. You offer us enslavement. Sable stormed away. Maldros held his gauze wrapped arms outward. His blazing red eyes were wide behind the black mask and helmet. A tall man with long black hair and dark eyes had traveled with him along with the women. Pallas and Ash were their names. Supposedly, they had helped Maldros win his freedom from enslavement. The man stepped forward, carrying a swirling monster jet orb with two hands and placed it on the podium of Rotten Down Swamp. <laughs> no matter. The chain and plated pauldron snapped backwards as Maldris roared out. Show me, my brother Eben. Show me your power. <sighs> she shut the book chuckling gently to herself. She was Squib, the Crusher, commander in Lord Palace's dark army over the Orc Battalions. How far they had come these last thirteen years. But though she loved violence, she wished to spare the lives of her people on this expedition. Tomorrow would hold no battle, as they were just fetching a simple artifact in an empty temple. Simple. She stood up and extinguished the candle as she laid upon the heavy bare furs of her bed. <sighs> Tomorrow we just grab and go. Again, simple. Too cold to hang out up here anyway. <laughs> Shouldn't be anything else of any interest in something like the Nether Spring. Sophie and Scott here! Follow me! Off the steps! Where did they come from? Jump! Ah! <sighs> the rotten steps that wound 25 feet from the ancient giant's moss-covered mouth around its throat into the ground were currently blocked by Dabria and Cordelia working their spells. Bedic saw the alternate route with a slide down the steep undergrowth on the giant's throat. Ah! Several orcs were charging across the cold stream between them, fording the knee-high water fueled by primal seal and drive to kill those who were now in their way. Ah! Dabria yelled in pain as the ragged end of a orcish javelin sailed into her left thigh, just below where the diamond-shaped black plate of her armor ended and opened to her knees, keeping her mobile as she preferred. Her golden eyes darted from the grinning face of the orc to the crashing form much larger. She felt her armor warm with arcane energy, the familiar chaos in which it was forged. She smiled, not knowing what would come next from the plate mail's enchanted response to the strike. Gabriel's pleasant surprise and his giant's dismay, she teleported to stand on her shoulder, reaching down to balance herself by gripping the root of one of her braids that was spilling from under the wicked horn of her iron helmet. Placing her other hand on her cheek, she drew out her life string in a red mist centralized on where her hand met the giant's skin. Yeah, wait, no. You stupid, stinky, ugly, ghostly, ugly, 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 ugly
As Skatmir ran down the incline that was once the throat of an ancient giant, he found himself entangled in several thorny vines that erupted around his ankles, dropping him into their twisted embrace. He frantically chopped at them, attempting to free himself. Sophie looked back behind her to see the dwarf's axe flailing madly from behind the attacking undergrowth. Sophie slashed at the outer vines as they began to reach out toward her as well. The blade lopped several with each stroke, sending them retracting and shrieking into the earth. I never thought I'd be taken out by a salad. Ha! Whoa! Watch out! <laughs> the rush of wind following a 30-foot serpentine shadow drove the pair to the safety of the earth around them as it flew overhead. <sighs> Steamy, chartreuse-colored, viscous fluid shot from behind the cool curved horn twisted black maw of the dragon's mouth toward the cringing white robed mage on the steps. Cordelia! A vibrant aura of blue magical energy erupted in front of her, driving the acidic flow away from her body. <laughs> Cordelia was driven to her knees by the force of the dragon's cost of breath. Evan laughed. You cannot escape your two as Cordelia dug deep within herself to prepare for the next attack from the massive adversary, Squib stormed across the shallow river, washing over a few of her family's orcish bodies. Bodies slain by these three fighters before her. There's... there's another one, Scott Mir. Yep. You there! Stand down! Even You don't know who I am. I am Scream the Crasher. Drama! Benedict saw her drop a crude leather bracer into the water as she walked, exposing a tattoo on her wrist in the shape of a T. She touched it and grinned cruelly. Drama! Yeah! There was a flash of light as rock and stone materialized in the air, creating a huge war hammer. The head was the size of a stone block from some forgotten fortress, and the stout two-and-a-half-foot handle was wrapped in ancient studded leather to form a powerful grip. In the same instant, her pace quickened as her eyes drew wide with the wild swing that smashed into the paladin's steel armor. <coughs> Bendix slid across a flat, slimy stone that was barely hidden under the icy, slow-moving water. No! Sophie splashed quickly across the water as she swung her sword in a wide arc down into Squib's exposed yeah! shoulder. Ah! You will pay for that, Rockhead. Rockhead? Yeah! Seems to fit you and that hammer better than me. Yeah! Back off, maggot! I've no time for this. That's it! Yeah! <laughs> With a single kick into her olive green stomach, Sophie dropped Squib into a ball before driving a mailed fist upward into her tusked face. The locks held the pewter warrior's beads, swung outward as she roared in pain and anger. The hammer began to glow with a red aura as she raised it above her head. Go to Sa! Tremor, the mighty hammer came down into the stones below the water, sending out a massive shock wave. Whoa! As the giant toppled to the ground from the earthquake, losing its footing, Dabria kipped into the air and landed deftly on her feet like a cat on the run. Ah! Darting across the battlefield, she drew her whip, squid locked eyes with her former comrade in the dark army. Realization setting down, but so far didn't wait. Ah! Uh, 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 uh. Sophie delivered blow after blow with her sword, hands and knees working in concert with each other. Squib's face leaked blood as she tried to open one swollen bloody eye. Back off! Flailing, her hammer met its mark in Sophie's side, driving her backward and stumbling to get her foot. Not now. Ebon, 
To me! Turning on a heel, she darted back out of the water. The dark shadow of the black dragon dropped low to pick her up around the waist and carry her off. Dabria stopped to help Benedict to his feet. Ooh. That's the other dragon rider from Port Lafour. Yeah. Squib. Well, I didn't think I'd see her again so soon. Yeah. Well, cat's out of the bag, I guess. Yes. We have no time. This is not a failure. You saw her. Oh, I saw her. That liar, that... Traitor! Yes, my brother. Another traitor to our precious family. Quickly, let us fly back to the Obsidian Fortress. I want to see the look on Nightblade's face as I tell Dekion about what their precious Dabria has been up to. Appearing in this episode, Benedict the Paladin, Brian Dowling, Cordelia the Fire Mage, Jolene Fresquez, Dabria, the Death Cleric, J.D. Rose, Eben, the Black Dragon, Matthew Bianchi, Frost Giant, Jolene Fresquez, Malgog, Patrick Mendelson, Maldros the Dark, Mike Atchley, Sable, the Lost Brother, Byron Thompson, Scottmere, the Dwarven Berserker, Colton Jansen, Sophie the Swordmaster, Sarah Jenkins, Squib, the Crusher, Piper Cleveland, Zoran, the Swashbuckler, Cody Miller, and Keldor, the Narrator, Mike Atchley. Thank you for joining us in this episode of Dice Tower Theater's Dawn of Dragons. Please join us in thanking our magnificent cast for their performance, and their full list can be found in the show notes. If you'd like a sticker from the show, please leave a review on any podcasting platform and send a screenshot to dm at dicetowertheater.com with a mailing address that we can send it to. In the next episode, we return to the ancient depths of the Netherspring. Will Zoran reunite the pieces of the God Slayer? What else lies in hiding within the giant ancient skull? Until then, fellow adventurers, stay safe and remember the oath. <laughs>